Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover in Barcelona. I'm Rebecca Knight, your host, along with my co-host and analyst, Rob Streche. We are welcoming back to theCUBE, a CUBE alum so many times around, uh, Justin Hotard. He is the Executive Vice President and GM HPC and AI Business Group and Hewlett Packard Labs. Welcome, Justin. Thanks, Rebecca. Great to be with you and Rob, and great to be back at uh, Discover in Europe. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a pretty cool conference. I mean, Barcelona, you can't, you can't go wrong. It's, it's hard, it's it's hard to go city. wrong. It's a great yeah. city. So I want to ask you, I want to start by asking you about this, this new announcement that HPE, earlier this month, a supercomputing solution for generative AI. Tell our viewers a little bit more about this turnkey solution. Yeah, I think fundamentally, you know, there's a couple things you're seeing with Gen AI. First of all, lots of energy around foundation large language models, but there's actually different parts to generative AI. People are training models for video, for voice, for image generation. Stable diffusion is the common one we talk about. And what we realized is, even in our scientific and technological communities, one size doesn't fit all, fit all but people need an easy way to get started. And so when working closely with NVIDIA, we saw this opportunity with uh, Grace Hopper coming out to build basically uh, you know, a, a scalable AI supercomputer in a box. And you can, build, you can buy one, you can buy four, you can buy eight. We like, you know, in, in, in uh, AI and HPC, we like multiples of four, so we'll stick to that. But, uh, but it, it allows you to really scale easily. And it's, um, it's all turnkey, it has all the software you need, um, comes completely packaged with our services, and, uh, and of course is liquid cooled, which we think is really important because that means you've got a much lower PUE out of the gate. Yeah, and, and I think, and again, we talked last back in June, and it's, it feels like a decade ago at this point it from, does. A, from an AI perspective. <laughs> it that, does. That, and I think a lot of that has to do with people are not sold on going to cloud for you know, AI in particular. I mean, because a lot of the data is still on-prem and they're looking to go and leverage that data out. Is that what you're seeing and why this solution really like kind of fit the bill for this time? Yeah, I, I think that's right, Rob. The, the, um, the reality is, is that AI is going to drive a different architecture. If you think about the cloud native architecture, the cloud of native architecture was all about virtualization. You know, much like what we do with our PCs or our mobile phones, how many apps can we run on one device, one server, right, one building block? That optimization, which makes a ton of sense whether you're in the public cloud or the private clouds like we've tr traditionally deployed in HP GreenLake, that's not the same architecture that you need for AI. In AI, what you need is a, uh, is a system that can scale out and run one, one workload. We talk a lot about the data center being the computer. And that's true in model training, but it's also true in tuning when you're trying to tweak a model with your own proprietary data, uh, which lots of people are starting to look at doing with large language models. And it's even going to be true in inferencing where you're trying to replicate and scale uh, these, you know, these large models for you know, very low latency, very fast, and very cost-effective inferencing. That's, that's what I was going to ask is, do you see that going, you know, inferencing tends to be where the sensors are, where you know, a, a co-location of a bunch of them closer to where the data is. Is that what you're seeing and one of the things that this is solving for? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think inferencing is going to be everywhere. I think inferencing is going to be where it makes the most sense, balancing for latency. You know, you're, you're obviously, we talk a lot about autonomous vehicles. You're not going to put, you're not going to put the inference engine for an autonomous vehicle in the cloud. But there's a lot of places, if you think about some of the embedded um, apps and services that we're seeing in Gen AI where it makes sense to have, uh, you know, it makes sense to have an app that's hosted. I mean, of course, most of our enterprise apps are now cloud apps. Putting the inferencing in the cloud for those apps makes sense. So it's going to be about where the data is, and to the point you made earlier, uh, also making it seamless to move data between uh, all of these locations, right? Because ultimately, when I'm training or tuning or retraining a model, I want I want to have the convenience of access to my data. And of course, you know, we're in Europe, so it's important to remember that many countries have very you know, thoughtful regulations around you know, data privacy, data mobility, and so we can't just assume we can centralize all this compute in one place. We have to move the, uh, move the compute to where the data is. Yeah, maybe one day the US will get that, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, we can kind of hope. Yeah. <laughs> When it comes to AI, and as you said, a year has felt like a decade, um, what are you seeing as the growing, where are the growing opportunities? Yeah, I, I think, Rebecca, they're in a couple of areas. I think one is in um, innovation around how to use it in enterprise use cases. So there's a, 
we'll talk we'll talk more about this this week. But um, RAG, uh, which is a new term, which is basically uh, retrieval augmented generation. So that's where I ask my uh, my AI chatbot or my my interface something uh, through through my prompt and. It, it doesn't pull the answer out of the AI model, but it goes and finds a document, right? This makes a ton of sense if I've got a bu bunch of technical support publications and I'm a customer, you know, customer service uh, organization and I ask a question and it just goes and finds the paragraph and provides the answer to the customer. Much better customer experience, more accurate, eliminates the, you know, the chance for human error and something like that. So that's one example. I think on the training side, we're just seeing more and more demand for specialized uh, use cases, right? And so our announcement with the University of Bristol, you know, here's a UK government who um, literally in a very short period of time is going to announce and deploy their largest supercomputer completely focused on AI with this similar um, similar stack to what we just talked about a couple weeks ago uh, that we launched a couple weeks ago with our um, uh, with our, you know, with our complete turnkey cluster with Grace Hopper nodes. So this is an example where the AI, where the UK realizes we need to get ahead, need, need to enable AI for our scientists and accelerate. And I think we're seeing more and more of that both in private enterprises as well as, uh, as the public sector. What, what does it mean to be an AI native architecture and what are kind of the key attributes of that? Yeah, if you were, you really start with the data. We've been, you know, we've been talking about data first modernization. Uh, Antonio, I think, talked about that a few years ago at yeah. Discover. Uh, and I think uh, maybe people didn't realize how, at the time, how prescient it was in terms of where we were headed. But it starts with the data. You know, it's not just enough to have the data. You've got to organize and structure the data. It's got to be formatted in a way you can manage it. You also need to be able to have the right controls on that data. You, you may find that certain, uh, we talked about privacy. You may find that as you're training models, there's um, there's data sets that you have to exclude for privacy. How do you, how do you uh, make sure you exclude those without impacting the integrity of your model? It's something we look at in terms of uh, data reproducibility. It's a solution we provide. So it starts with the data, then it's about having a full stack of, uh, um, of solutions from software all the way down into the infrastructure to services for a purpose built for AI, whether you're training or tuning or, or deploying inferencing. And then finally, it's about you know, recognizing that this entire environment needs to be hybrid because as we talked about, where, you, where you, one customer trains versus where they deploy is going to be distributed from, from edge to cloud and we need to make sure that they can deploy everywhere and use the right, uh, the right solution, whether it's public or private cloud Right, the right architecture for them to, to deploy and use the environment. Yeah, an another place that Antonio was very early on was the hybrid nature, yep. and we we talk about super cloud and a cloud operating model everywhere, and I, I think that you know he definitely leaned in on that. Yeah, and what I'm excited about, you know, we'll, we'll have some announcements this week. I'm I'm excited about the fact that we're also now saying, you know, GreenLake was the right place for your private cloud, but some of the capabilities we're building into it, we've been building into it actually have set us up perfectly to make it the ideal destination when you go build that AI native architecture. And you know, the last point I'd make there is sustainability. We announced sustain the sustainability dashboard earlier this year. Um, you know, that's, that's core to everything we do in HPC and supercomputing. We we're a you know, world leader in, uh, in liquid cooling. We've got tons of IP and patents in that space. And that, uh, that's really important because we can't add all of this computing uh, with it, and, and expect to just impact our carbon footprint. It has to be done in a way that's carbon neutral or ideally carbon negative if we can, so we can do it. That, I mean, that is so interesting to me. We're having a lot of European guests, and I know you live basically on an airplane, so you, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're having a lot of European guests who are talking about sustainability and, and making sure that it, that, that it really is fundamentally built into the system. A lot of that is because there are these more thoughtful regulations in, in Europe. How do you talk about it with customers? How do you approach this with customers? And, and what are you hearing if there are differences between how the US and, and how European countries are, are thinking about this? Yeah, I think, I think in the US there's, um, there's still a bit of a divide. I think there's a lot of words. There's probably less action when we talk to customers. And some customers are saying, I just want to get you know, the solution as quickly as possible. I'll address, it's, yes, it's important, but I'll address it later. I think everybody says it's important, but you see that action. And then we've got some great customers. You know, we announced a couple weeks ago a partnership with a company called Darkbyte, uh, Darkbyte AI. That's uh, that's really leading in the space. They're building a secure cloud uh, and a uh, incredibly green cloud. And that um, that's the kind of solution that um, you know where we think there's a lot of you know really good thought leadership, and they're well positioned because they're starting with the premise that their entire ecosystem needs to be carbon 
carbon negative and they see it not only as an importance for sustainability but also for security. So we see customers, you know, I think a little bit bifurcated in the, in the US. In Europe, I think the message is very clear. I mean, you know, partners like Taiga Cloud, who's, who's here on the show floor with us, um, you know, they're, they're starting with the premise that everything they do has to be sustainable because it's not going to, it's not going to be viable in Europe, uh, you know, and certainly for their customers, many of the model developers and deployers, unless it's sustainable. Yeah, I, I think that you just hit on a really good point and I, I think want to double click into it is that it's not that people won't build models in the cloud, but there's also a lot of these smaller clouds that are popping up that are AI specific. Are you seeing that as really a strong space for where, hey, you've been building you know, Frontier and others for years now and taking that DNA and injecting it into those clouds? Yeah, I, I think for a couple of reasons, Rob. First is you, you touched on the one, which is we have the expertise scaling large systems, and it's more than just um, it's more than just the engineering and how we design these systems, but it's the on-site services, how we deliver. It's very, very different than a traditional you know, private or public cloud environment where a node fails and you you know you just don't worry about it because you, re, you redistribute your workloads. On these systems, you know, every node is critical, right? And and uh, and getting high availability and reliability matters. And so the AI native architecture, we see that. The other thing I think these um, some of these startups are doing is they're they're because they're very very focused on large scale. Um, we're you know we're working with them closely, but we're seeing differentiation because they recognize that a customer needs a full commitment, right? It's not like I, I want to have this for I want to have this capacity for a short period of time. Um, you know, and, and uh, I'm willing to I'm willing to be flexible on my use, or I'm going to use it for a couple hours. Customers are looking for commitments of scale and capacity over weeks, months, even years in some cases, and that's really that, that's the other reason we see um, some of these you know these cloud startups as being really relevant. In addition to being thoughtful around sustainability or the security models that matter, as I touched on earlier. So November 30th marks the anniversary when ChatGPT was unleashed into the world. And, but one thing that's really coming through in this conversation with you is, is the real need to do AI responsibly and ethically to reduce risk, but also because it is the right thing to do. How do you talk to customers about this and, and, and what are you hearing from them in terms of they, how they're approaching this? Yeah, I think first of all, Rebecca, we've been a, a, a leader in this for some time. We actually worked with the World Economic Forum and some other companies to, to create a, a standard around responsible AI and, and view on AI ethics. And so that's something that's very core to us. When we talk to customers about it, I think, um, I think one of the benefits of, of ChatGPT is people have realized that this is important. And so we're building it into our tools. It's, it's embedded in uh, you know, some of the tools I talked about that provide reproducibility. That's one element expanding our machine learning development environment into, into areas where it allows you to do so responsibly. We've got a, um, a demo that's on the show floor around uh, our Gen AI studio, which allows you to figure out how best to use it, but it provides the visibility so a developer, a traditional software developer, not even a data scientist can see what's happening and be able to interrogate it. I think it's going to be, it's a place where customers are very, very focused on it. They see the value, but they want to be they really want to make sure they're, you know, they're managing it responsibly. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, I think beyond just LLMs, right? There's a lot of excitement about LLMs, and ChatGPT has been a phenomenal accelerator, right, in terms of the broader AI market. But when you get into, to, you know, some of our partners and customers doing work around scientific models or looking at, you know, climate for long-term or mid-term climate forecasting, or thinking about how to implement AI to accelerate traditional high performance computing simulations, they realize that the integrity of the model is foundational. And, and that's, you know, that, that's sort of a, a non-negotiable for most of them. Because if they don't have that, then their entire uh, research project or business model is built on a house of cards. It would, it would make sense that, again, AI, like you said, has been around for a long time. It's not brand new, even though ChatGPT is a year old. And I, I think ML, which is the Yep. You know, basis for a lot of that models has been around for, and that's really the core to where this technology has been used. Like you said, weather forecasting has been done on this stuff for, you know, quite some time. All like I, I love seeing like the European model versus the North American model and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you seeing people now that they've 
been exposed to things like Gen AI that are revisiting how they might use ML as well? Is that really spurring that out long as well? Yeah, I think traditional classification learning is, uh, you know, is actually getting a boost as well. I mean, I was at a, uh, I was at a, a forum in uh, New York uh, about a month and a half ago, and it was interesting. We were talk, we were actually it was a health, it was all about health and life sciences. And we were talking about, you know, one of the one of the phenomenal applications is uh, is is uh, computer vision for radiology, right? Helping radiologists, but the penetration's been fairly low. But now, because of the boon in AI, you're seeing some of the manufacturers embed more and more of this into their core products. So it's no long, longer an adjunct. And this was a kind of an open discussion in the forum. You know, many of the companies there are presenting, and some of the the health professionals. It's probably one example, but I think what's been great about um, Gen AI, it feels a bit like the, you know, the Netscape or the mosaic moment of the internet, right? Everyone's all of a sudden realized, I remember that moment when I was in college and we realized we could, you know, check basketball scores and, and whether I wasn't checking the stock market as much as I probably <laughs> should have been in college. Yeah. But you could check those things in real, you know, relatively real time. And I think that aha moment is what's happened. And it is causing people to go back to all the, the various ways they can use this, which is exciting because I think that's that's probably where more of the the, the tremendous impact in terms of the social value and the, you know, the, the real value in terms of how we advance the way people live and work, which is core to our purpose at HPE, where that real value actually comes to bear. And are you seeing that that's, like you said, you brought up uh, healthcare, retail, like being able to do recommendations engines and things of that yeah. nature, where you have to be careful about PII and other things. Are you seeing different applications of ML and AI in those Different across the different verticals. Yeah, I think it's I think it's probably the you know the federation of that to the broader industry, right? If you look at if you look at the big the the, the large um, internet players or you know tier one hyperscalers as we think of them, they, they've got you know tons of ML and DL in their models, right? And you know recommenders and 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 other other various elements of analytics, in, you know obviously computer vision and other areas. I think what this does is it it brings the the bar. Uh, it lowers the, the the hurdle, right, so that everybody can raise the bar in terms of a retailer that now wants to provide that recommender engine who may not be, you know, one of the two big online retailers in the world. Right. Yeah, excellent. Well, just these are exciting times. Thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE. Yeah, it was great to see you both, and uh, thanks again for having me. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Strecce. You are watching The Cube, and there is much more of our coverage of HPE Discover in Barcelona. You're watching The Cube, the leader in technology coverage. Mm -hmm.